What a privilege it is and honor it is to have Apostle Matthew Stevenson in our midst. Can you, TLC Campus Rush, Ottawa, Canada, can you give him a warm welcome into the city and to the nation of Canada? We honor the oil, sir. We salute the grace upon your life. on Instagram and I began to see the ministry of Apostle ministering and immediately there was a connection in the spirit on my end. I knew that God would do something and align something in his own time to have him minister to the nation of Canada starting from the capital. How many of you guys know that there's something prophetic about starting from the capital reaching out to the rest of the nation? Do you know that? Hold up. Do you know that you can struggle in other places, but when there's a shift in the capital, things begin to align in the realms of the spirit. And so what better way to have an apostle who shares the same spirit as we do to flow in this atmosphere. Now, TLC, we're about to turn our, our attention to the screen to enjoy the bio, but the moment the bio is done, we are going to welcome the ministry of Dr. Matthew Stevenson to TLC Campus Rush and to the nation of Canada. Please, audiovisual team, if you're ready, let's get it by. Dr. Matthew L. Stevenson III is vastly becoming an internationally respected voice for this time in history. He is a powerful governmental prophet, an apostolic overseer, and a leader's leader. A thinker, discerner of the times, and a polemic sound all describe what his life brings to the kingdom of God. He has been in ministry for 16 years and has served as the senior pastor of All Nations Worship Assembly for 12 years. Prior to full-time ministry, he was a highly matriculated academic working for the public education sector both as a practitioner and in public administration. He holds three earned academic degrees in the areas of leadership, education, and ministry. To date, Dr. Stevenson has published six books and has traveled ministering the word of the Lord to politicians and public officials, entertainers, professionals, athletes, and leaders in 16 nations and counting. The primary earmark of his ministry is undoubtedly provocative preaching unprecedented revelation, and a very uncommon demonstration of the supernatural gifts of the Holy Spirit. As an apostolic overseer, he oversees over 60 ministries through the Skate Network, which is a family of churches and ministries around the world that look to Dr. Stevenson for supervision, oversight, and apostolic leadership. Aside from being committed to his personal destiny, he considers his greatest contribution and achievement being the pillar of his family. He's the husband of Dr. Camilla Stevenson, a former professional medical researcher and his co-laborer in life and ministry, and he's the natural father of three. Many people around the world have been radically shifted by his ministry and personally impacted by his father's heart. Campus Rush, please rise as we welcome Dr. Matthew L. Stevenson III. Let's just lift our hands to the Lord real quick and invite the Spirit of God in this place. He's here. We want to welcome his agenda. We want to welcome his attitude. We want to welcome what he desires to do. Holy Spirit, you are everything that we are not. And we empty ourselves in this moment in between time and eternity to receive of you. We thank you for your mind, your mood your strength being in this building and we thank you that this environment is under arrest we thank you that you are moving in every heart to redeem time to break curses to open up different levels of depth in you we bless this nation we say that she is in travail and that as we gather this weekend you're going to induce what you've been bringing out of this place we bless every leader, every ministry gift 
and we thank you now that the heavens are open and that your word is coming to pass with power. Now manifest yourself strong and say what you want in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's lift up one more shout to the Lord all over this building. Come on, salute the King. He's worthy of praise. Hallelujah. Amen. Before we take our seats, can we acknowledge our bishop and our pastor, Coffee, and all of the team. God bless you, kind sir. You can be seated in heavenly places. It is such an honor to be here, and uh, I have no clue how so many of you know who I am. But, but we are grateful to the Lord for his kindness and to all of you that are here. I sense something very unusual taking place prophetically, and uh, I just want to be able to give expression to what that is and, and, and what God wants to do. How many of you are in need of a word from the Lord? Let me see your hand. To the extent that if God does not say something to you, uh, that you are unwilling to move. God has to talk. God has to talk. And uh, we are in that time, and we need those types of instructions. And I do believe I have something from God. And uh, I'll try my best to behave tonight and then see what happens tomorrow. But I do, again, want to acknowledge you and thank you so very much for your kindness, for your hospitality, uh, and for all that you've done to make this event possible. God bless you and all that you uh, do. Um, I want to make mention of the fact that I did bring some books. Uh, foundations are very important, and we're living in a time in every nation in the body of Christ where God is visiting foundations. Um, there's a lot of things being built, but there are not very many things that are being built with God's mind and heart. And uh, how many of you understand that the church is not the body until Christ is the head? What God is doing is examining foundations, the foundations of people, the foundations of ministries, the foundations of, of decisions, and he's inspecting them. And one of the things that the, that the Lord has ver convicted me about is that as a believer, you should never build a foundation in what you do well. Because when what you do well changes, then you go into an identity crisis that opens your life to all types of snares from the enemy. Your foundation, foundation as a believer is in the revelation of God as Father. If you don't start as a son, you will end as a slave. And it is so important that we take our destiny, our future, our, 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 our potential out of the hands of talent. And that we start to explore our relationship with God as Father. Jesus said, pray this way, our Father which are in heaven. And what I've learned is that in every culture, in every nation, a large part of God's difficulty with people is that people interact with him as if he is their natural father. So whatever mistakes or inconsistencies or ideas or experiences that we have had in the hands of men subconsciously get projected on our relationship with God. And it's easily seen by how often God has to reiterate his word to us, what it takes for us to believe him, because we brace ourselves to be disappointed. And so I wrote a book specifically for talented people, for people who see themselves as high achievers, uh, as highly driven, uh, and it's a book called Abba, and it is the total revelation of God as Father. It deals with separation anxieties. It deals with fear of failure. How many of you know there is no greater terror on earth like the fear of failure? There are more people who are afraid of failure than death, and so I believe for what God is pouring out in the earth, a part of what he has to address is the deathly fear of failure. All of that is addressed in my book, and so I brought a lot of that. I don't know where it is, but I'm certain you will find it, and uh, I want you to go and get that and correct your foundations. The Bible says if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? And I want to make sure that what you do next has longevity by making sure you're not starting it in yourself or your gift or your skill, but in your revelation that I am a son. The Bible says that it was through him that we gave, we were received the power to become the sons of God. And history has it that when God wants to get the job done, he sends a son. And so in order to succeed in what you're going to do, you're going to have to see yourself as a son. Amen? Amen. 
All right, I have a word from the Lord tonight, and we're going to activate this corporately. Um, God is, is talking to me, and I don't know what's been being taught here or what's been being proclaimed, but uh, I sense very strongly that tonight, uh, between tonight and the two nights, but especially tonight, a part of what I'm supposed to declare unto you or to preach to you is how to protect the anointing. God is doing something in the earth. Um, and, and with this people where he is heightening the anointing in the midst of you. I sensed very strongly that there was coming a greater corporate anointing. There were coming greater individual anointings. And so I'm going to work through what that means to you, what your responsibilities are to it and how that works. Very specifically, what I feel like is taking place as a byproduct of this revival is that this is going to unlock a time where the kingly and the prophetic anointing are going to start to work in tandem. And those are born in prayer, but uh, there have been moments in history where those two anointings are at odd. One of the, the things that happened to Saul was that he mismanaged his anointing. Now, there's a lot of different teachings and preachings about how Saul in it up where he was, but you cannot forget that he was anointed and kissed by the prophet. Uh, and so it was his uh, casual relationship with the anointing that made him subsequently forfeit it and end his life up in insanity. And we, you and I, those of us that are of a, a supernatural DNA, we have a regard for the glory of God, the presence of God. There is a great risk to become used to the anointing of God because we are so filled with revelation and we see healings and deliverances and we see the the demon the demonstrations of the Spirit of God, and we have to really have a warning about becoming calming with the anointing. You have to be careful about what you allow yourself to become used to, and the people of God said amen. So I want to talk to you about the anointing that is on your life. I'm going to give you several types of anointings and then walk you through a text, and the text obviously is going to be Isaiah 61. It's, it's what Jesus reiterated when he first platformed or mounted the platform in Israel. And I find it very, very unique that Jesus did not begin his ministry in defense of his assignment. He didn't create or start his ministry even with a vision of what the future would be. The first thing that came out of his mouth was, I am anointed. And he aligned the expectations of people based upon the anointing that was on his life. And I'm going to work through that. When you are being launched into whatever area, whatever area of ministry that you're going to be commissioned into, it is important that you learn to align people's expectation. If you are an evangelist, you have to align that expectation. If you are a prophet, you have to align that expectation. If you are an intercessor, you have to align that expectation. Expectation, and here's why. If you don't correct people's expectation of what's on your life, they're going to end up robbed when you don't produce what it is that they wanted. So it is vitally important that you become acquainted with the individual anointing on your life and how it functions. And in Isaiah 61.1, it says, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. It is upon me. Now, there is a strong difference between the spirit of God upon you and the spirit of God in you. When the Spirit of God comes upon a man, it is for the purposes of the people they're called to. But the Spirit of God within you are for your own regenerative purposes. When we pray in the Spirit and we spend time in intercession, that's renewing our inner man. Our inner man. It's, it's, it's dealing with our capacity. It's confronting our limitations, and it's broadening out the ability of God in us. But when the Spirit of God comes upon a man, like it was upon Samson or like it was upon John, the Baptist, it is for external use, and there is a difference. You can achieve things with the Spirit of God within you, but you can also achieve different things when the Spirit of God comes upon you. Remember when Samson was confronted with a lion, he was able to tear the beast apart because of what came upon him. When things come upon you, when the Spirit of God comes upon you, either environmentally or while you're in worship or while you're engaging the Word of God, 
God, what's coming upon you is for something monstrous. God is raising men in this very room that are called to wild beasts. They're, they're going to be things that manifest and things that are being, I mean, freaks of nature that are the byproduct of our culture and its perversion. And God is pouring out things upon men that will rip them to pieces. There is a level of demonization active in the earth right now that the average Christian has no clue about. But I believe what God is giving us to counteract the level of darkness that's coming through our universities and through many churches and through bad doctrine and false prophets is the spirit of God upon a man. The spirit of God that descends upon a man and grips him to tear something up. Come on, say it is so. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. Now, when he announces that he has been anointed, he does not leave that statement there. It's not an open-ended statement. He now begins to go into the several facets of his anointing because the anointing upon you can be multifaceted. I really believe that it was God's intent that every family have an anointing on it, every company have an anointing on it. Where I'm from, uh, I am a spiritual warfare person. I, I have a very strong deliverance bent. I believe that there are buildings, literal, literal architecture. A part of what we don't realize is how much of the Old Testament was a war over land, the terra firma, the dry land. One of the first things that God gave Adam was the right to rule the land. And in my country, one of the chief wars that very many apostles or visionaries are in is the right to acquire land. I believe it's demonic. Satan wants whole movements to be homeless because he knows that whoever owns the land wins the war. But buildings, if they are on the earth, they have creative purpose. They have potential. There is a reason why God allowed every literal facility to get erected on earth. And what we need are kings who can not only address the purpose and the potential in people, but who can also retrieve the destiny in whole buildings. How many of you understand that there are factories and there are schools and there are universities that came into the earth with the permission of God? And if they came into the earth with the, the permission of God, then it means that there has to be a a purpose on that building that God needs the, a man or a woman to get the guts to retrieve and use for the purposes of God. It is a part of spiritual warfare. We have to do more than bind and loose in prayer. We've got to bind and loose by purchasing and acquiring areas in our city that have been claimed by darkness. We're going to read this, but I just sense this right now. I declare over this people that every witch is coven, every place that's been erected as a temple of tolerance, every sanctuary of perversion that's been erected in this in this city in this nation God is turning over the synagogue of Satan and handing over deeds to princes and prophets in the name of Jesus Christ who is the anointed one get ready for buildings to yield their fruit to you your company your program it is so in Jesus name I am anointed Jesus says to preach good tidings to the meek. The first function of Jesus' anointing was proclamation. And you're going to notice as you engage this that there are certain functions to teaching that differ from preaching. Teaching appeals to the intellect. You are matured by teaching. It is the basis of what you understand that allows for you to be tested systemically speaking. But preaching has different uh, 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 objectives to it. Preaching is going to appeal to the heart of a man. It, it does not rationalize with the intellect or the, cere the cerebral front of a man. It reaches right past experience to the core of a man. And one of the things that we really do need to see is an increase in preaching. I mean anointed preaching. The crap that we hear in America that passes for preaching is the reason why we've not seen revival. Everything that we call revival is some humanly organized agenda 
under driven by the flesh to push the brand of a man. But when we've got anointed preaching, you could be preaching for four minutes and a demon will cry out of the back saying, Jesus, thou son of David, have you come to torment us? Come on, look at somebody say, I'm anointed, I'm anointed, I'm anointed. Doesn't it interest you? that after three years the disciples were still confused about who Jesus was some say you are the Christ some say you are Elijah but the minute Jesus opened up his mouth to preach a demon screamed out in a synagogue saying I know exactly who you are what we need is a reputation in heaven that gets a response upon the earth because the anointing has come upon us to advance the purposes of God in the earth so I want to challenge those of you that preach to contend for a greater preaching anointing. There are certain times where you need to teach and you need to labor like Paul said in doctrine. But there are other things that can be conceived by the power of the declarative tongue. I believe that God puts the spirit of wisdom in the mouth of preachers and he makes things stand on halt until his purposes are produced. We need anointed preaching, not just rhymes and rhythms and points and illustrations. We need preaching that legitimately redeems time, preaching that reverses iniquitous pattern in people, preaching that pushes people out of the realm of indecision into the realm of wholehearted devotion and preaching produces that. Jesus said, I've been anointed to preach. He has sent me to bind the brokenhearted. Now the way the anointing works is like this. When you grow up in charismatic circles, especially where I'm from, the anointing is a feeling. It's I feel the anointing. Or the anointing is is something that kind of comes and goes. But in the Bible, to be anointed was an official act. It, it was not something that you could feel like a, 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 a goose bump or something. It was literally an official act. To be anointed in the Old Testament meant to be separated unto a purpose relative for that moment. You were anointed to be distinctive. You, the oil was placed upon you to mark you, so much so that you could not blend in ever again. So it was never something that could come and go based upon what was gone. And we say, you know, that song was anointed or that prayer was anointed. But we've not highlighted the function of the anointing on that thing. And so it's easy to disrespect to disregard or to ignore what the anointing does is because we're so common to using that language. But the anointing was an official act. And you had the kingly anointing. Kings were anointed. You had the priestly anointed. Priests were anointed. You had the prophetic anointing. Remember God told Elijah, I want you to anoint Elisha in your stead. I believe that servants were anointed. There were men that were marked to serve. In my own church, I've become very, very, very burdened as of lately about how many armor bearers are not anointed. It, it, it's more than pouring water and getting mints. When you serve in the, in, the, in, the, in the realm of armor bearing, your job is to make the war easy. You are the front line of defense for whatever is coming against who you're supposed to be protecting you can't volunteer for that type of act you must be anointed why because what's after that your leader is going to come and test you to see if you made of the same stuff and if they come upon you and realize that you are not made of what your leader is made of you will be devoured so you've got to be anointed to serve you are not just some religious butler you are literally an officer in the spirit with official capacity to prepare the grounds for whatever work your leader has to do. So if you are not aware of the work that your leader does, if you are not aware of the angelic reaction that comes when your leader speaks, then you're just a waiter or a waitress. But an armor bearer has been anointed to carry the exterior fighting weaponry of the man or the woman he's been sent to. So you had to be anointed. There was a priestly anointing. In the Old Testament, priests had to wear pomegranates on the end of their robe. If they tried to journey too far, 
beyond their experience, beyond their endurance, and they drop dead, the sound of the pomegranate would hit a bell at the edge of their robe to let somebody out there know this priest was an unprepared priest. This priest was not a priest who was ready for the depth that they desire. How many of you know there are many of us who cry out for the deep things of God and we won't let him have the deep things in us. Many of us are calling for God to be the Lion of Judah and we're saying kitty, 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 here kitty, kitty, kitty and we forget that he has teeth and when you call the fire of God in the room, the first thing he doing is coming for what's in you that's not like him so you're calling for it to turn everybody else's heart but he's looking to separate common ground in you that's revival it's birthed by no common ground no compromise and you must be anointed to handle that so Jesus now listen to this he teaches us through reiterating Isaiah 61 that the anointing on you will determine several things. It's going to determine your audience. You are not anointed for tasks. This is a common charismatic misconception. You are not anointed for tasks. So by that version, you could get up and sing Amazing Grace and, or sing a song and worship and it really be powerful. But in our vocabulary, we said, man, that was really anointed. But if there was no fruit, then the song had no function. So a song needs a function. A prayer needs a function. If you cannot identify the function, you cannot find a reason for the anointing. And in the Bible, you will never find where there was wasted oil. So God does not pour out the anointing on people for, to fill it. It is for a place and a people. So if you are anointed, that's the easy part. The hard part is finding out who for. Now, why is that important for you? Because you will not be anointed in every place. We, we, we often think about, because we, we, we see the anointing as our personal property or possession. So we try to find effectiveness in front of every environment. But there are going to be some environments where they celebrate you. And they receive you. And you change their lives. And there are going to be other people who think you're too much. You're too extra. You're extreme. I don't like that. And it doesn't mean those people are demonic. It means that those are not the people you're called to. The anointing on you will determine who likes you. But it will also determine who hates you. Some of the people that hate you actually need you. Nobody likes you likes the surgery and nobody likes the inoculant so you have to be able to trace the audience that's been assigned to your anointing you will live your life in agony trying to force a people you've not been anointed for to receive you 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 will live your life in excruciating pain and frustration trying to force your anointing to fit a culture that restricts your reason of it. My goodness. So you have to realize that this anointing requires integrity. Jesus says, I've been anointed to bind the brokenhearted, to mend the brokenhearted. I believe that nations can have a broken heart. Families can have a broken heart. If you look at my nation, we are a brokenhearted nation right now. The nation's capital reveals the heartbeat of the nation. But what happens is, when you don't pay attention to the heartbeat of a people, then you pray amiss concerning what it needs. If a nation needs to repent, the wrong thing to do is to curse it and condemn it. If a nation needs to repent, you've got to pray for a broken spirit, a contrite heart, that that nation responds to God's acts of mercy. Because mercy and judgment must flow together. If you have too much mercy, then it will become perverse because it won't have parameters for correction.
If you have too much judgment, you're not going to get the redemptive purposes of wrath. When God allows his anger to flow through a place or a people, it always has redemptive purposes. He is trying to restore, redeem, or retrieve something out of that. But what's happened in the kingdom is either we have had judgment or either we have had mercy. But to see the both of them is what revival really is. We don't just want fire. We want fire and water. We don't just want rain. We want rain and smoke. We need the old and the new testament. We need the water and the wine. And we preach and teach as if it's either or when it's really both and. We need judgment and mercy. Broken heartedness is an issue that needs the anointing. Now as I'm walking through this, what I'm trying to help you to realize is you can look at your immediate pains your immediate environments, the people that are attracted to you and the people that attack you, and you can come up with an idea of what your anointing is. If Jesus was anointed to the brokenhearted, who do you think were going to be attracted to him? People who had a broken heart. Now, this is so important for you to realize because as you serve in purpose in ministry, many of you will run the risk of becoming frustrated with your own assignment. You will get mad about the quality of people around you when they're drawn to what's on your life for a reason. So I'm teaching you to protect your anointing so that you don't get frustrated with who it attracts. Does that make sense? She says, he sent me to bind the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives. If it does not free a person, it was not the anointing. You, you don't need to be anointed to encourage. <laughs> You've got a lot of self-help coach people for that. You can get encouragement from anybody. You can Google encouragement. The planets are yelling that stuff out. People are going to Zodiac. You don't need encouragement. You can get encouragement from a fortune cookie. But the anointing is not just to encourage you. It's to free you. The Bible says in Isaiah 10, 27, in that day, the yoke will be destroyed because of the anointing. And it does not say that the yoke will be broken. It says destroy. If something is broken, it can be put back together. But when something is destroyed, its function, its origin, its reason is completely unrecognizable. And God wants to give men and women anointings don't, that don't break yokes, but that destroy the harnesses that come from hell. That hold people hostage out of holiness, out of prosperity, out of freedom, and out of purpose. So it takes the anointing to do that. Liberty to the captive. Every nation, every people, every church is called to a type of prisoner. That's not just for missionaries. That's not just for people who walk the street and witness. It's for every New Testament believer. And you need to become acquainted with the prisoner you've been assigned to. As some of us have been assigned to people who, who, who are first offenders. Others of us have been assigned to people who are in insane asylums. But people like me, I'm assigned to people on death row. See, I have an emergency anointing. God literally sends me people who, 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 who are this close out of the grips of the powers of death. Either this anointing is going to work or they're going to leave God altogether. It's a 911 anointing. How many of you realize that there is an amber alert that has gone out in the spirit because before people realize that they can abduct people. Satan has been abducting souls since the Garden of Eden. So what happens is if you don't have people that comprehend that you are most effective in dark times then you get frustrated when doors don't open or frustrated when it seems like you're not moving. But there are some of us who has been held back so that the wickedness level could increase. Because if God sends some of us out before darkness is ripe, then the world is not going to understand why we we're here. You are not being held back. You're being pushed back like an arrow. And when darkness gets ripe enough, when the powers of hell get ripe enough, he's going to shoot you. It's got to get dark enough. 
it has to get dark enough. When it's dark enough, the world will accommodate what rests on you and you don't have to adjust to what's active in it. Talks about liberty to the captives. Now he talks about and opening the prisons to those that are bound. Opening the prisons to those that are bound. He, he is tearing off the several levels of how his anointing works. He's basically saying, if you are captive, I am anointed to, for you. If you have experienced a prison sentence. Now, in the scriptures, you should see a prison sentence as a curse. A right, not R-I-G-H-T, but R-I-T-E, a demonic covenant, a contract. And there are certain sin issues and iniquitous patterns that open up people to demonic contracts. The prophets of old proclaimed in the book of Isaiah, I will annul your covenant with death. The, the, the spirit of perversion that's come through this culture is not just moving rapidly to get people stuck in sin and sex and fornication and, 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 and abortion. And it's not that, that's not the point. The point of the spirit and the agenda of perversion is to get people to come and covenant with the spirit of death. That's what happened to Onan. That's what happened to Sodom. That's what happened to David when he fell with Bathsheba. The objective, the, the objective of lust is death. It's not just pleasure and sensuality the bible says when sin is conceived it brings forth death when lust is conceived it brings forth death so the greater strong man behind the porn industry and the greater strong man behind prostitution and the greater strong man behind molestation and the greater strong man behind sex trafficking is the spirit called death now death is an event death is an agenda but death is also a kingdom it has several ambassadors that represent it in several generations so when God says when Jesus says I've been anointed to open prisons and to say to them that are a captive go free he said I have the anointing to reverse the judgment of your criminal act I have been anointed to make sure that you don't have to live incarcerated because of a thing that happened to you or something that you happen to in a moment of passion and we are living in days especially now where God wants to regulate the passions of his people he wants to sanctify the passions of his people and make sure that his people have right passions that can be used in prayer as and not self-destruction prison doors this is the season for the loosing of prison doors the reversing of judgments. I believe that there are certain spirits that are, that, that are almost like demonic stalkers. They will pay attention to a family and follow it for generations. It will say, I am the cancer demon. And they'll come after your great-great-grandfather. They'll try to come. To, now, the, the medical doctors call it genetic. They, 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 they say it's hereditary. What I call it is a generational curse. And it has active right because of what's in your blood pattern. Uh, but this is why the Bible says that without the shedding of blood, there could be no remission of sins. So we must use the blood of Jesus to reverse every judgment that was in our blood before we got saved. Before you got saved, you were the seed and the byproduct of whatever contract was open on your life because of whoever opened up a door before you got here. How about when you submit to Jesus Christ and you make him king, what happens is the blood that is on the mercy seat now becomes transfused in you and you may look like your father or look like your mother but now whatever was after them uh, has no right to you uh, because of the blood transfusion but what happens is uh, if you are ignorant about that uh, and if you are unlearned about that you will live your life uh, under the consequence uh, of the, the decisions of generations before you uh, uh, but when you experience the anointing uh, one of the things it does is it breaks the power of generational curse and it enforces generational blessings it's called heritage inheritance purpose and prosperity but you will never have generational blessings where a curse is still in operation and curses are not broken because you want them to be broken 
They're not broken because you wish them away. You must experience the anointing. And it is my objective that we need some curse-breaking churches. We need some curse-breaking intercessors. We need some curse-breaking husbands. We need some curse-breaking wives. We need some curse-breaking preachers. We need prophets who break curses. Who am I told? We need teachers who break the curse of ignorance. We need teachers uh, who reverse the curse of darkness, uh, who open people's eyes. And you do that through the anointing. That is the opening of prisons. Jesus said, I've been anointed to open up prisons. And then he says, I've been anointed to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of the vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes. He has given us about nine or ten different bullet-pointed functions of what rested on his life. Now, part of what I'm trying to show you is you cannot work what's on you until you get acquainted with it. If, if I were to give you a microphone or interview you, would you be able to describe how the anointing on you functions? Or would you generalize it? And would you give it a nice Christian mission statement and say, I've been anointed to help people? Well, we all have, right? But what are the specific strengths and zeals and burdens and burnings that are in you? What, what, what can you not overlook that other people overlook all the time? What, 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 what breaks you? What, what is your agitation in the kingdom? If you can examine all of that, you end up being able to trace and track something that God is trying to anoint you to achieve. Now, there is a such thing as being anointed and not ready. Being anointed does not mean being prepared. And there are a lot of people who learn of their anointings and they do not prepare for its functions. And so we misrepresent what's on us out of zeal. But your anointing should determine what you study, what you investigate. Many of you have made the mistake of taking on an assignment beyond your information. None of you would allow a dentist to perform heart surgery on you. You would not allow a car mechanic to do brain surgery on you. So it is in the natural, where the more informed you are about your opponent, the more effective you can be when you are facing it. You see, the anointing gives you the official right to act, but the information makes you effective as you act. Every shepherd, for example, everybody knows that David was a shepherd boy. And then how we paint him, you know, the, 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 he, his brothers were the warriors and, and the military men. And he was just out there kissing little lambs and sheeps and writing poetry and mwah, 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 mwah. But what you, you, you realize that when a giant, a, a literal bizarre monster approaches a culture, nobody has the courage to face it. And that's because the people that were around had not trained to fight things bigger than them. His brothers, Eliab, all of those guys were used to fighting human beings. The levels had to be the same. David, however, was accustomed to fighting things that were genetically different from him. He was not afraid of monsters. And we know that because what he says is, hey, the reason I'm qualified to approach the Philistine is because the other day, when a lion and a bear came to snatch the sheep, your servant went against the lion and against the bear, and I smote it with my bare hands. Now, what is David revealing? He is revealing that I am prepared for this moment because I was anointed for the moment. I'm ready for Goliath, not because of my personal vision statement or logo, but because of my preparation. When I was anointed, it didn't just make me fall out and get back up. When I got up, I went to prepare. And I started to study the audience of what was upon my life. And I'm used to handling things that are bigger than me. So that gives me an expertise for this giant. Hmm. Every good shepherd has to learn to be a hunter first. I've taught this to pastors in America. Our problem is we want to shepherd a sheep we don't know how to protect. 
and we don't know how to protect them because we're not acquainted with their enemies. All we know about is what's going to help them and what's going to heal them, but we must be acquainted with what's going to harm them. We must fight what's fighting our people. You're not going to be able to free people from poverty if you've not personally conquered it. You see, the rule of authority is this. If it's active in you, you can't have any authority over it. So when you get anointed, uh, you start to investigate uh, who God's going to use you for, uh, what he's going to use you to achieve, uh, and then you step on the platform uh, of the hearts of a people and you free them because of what you've been through. So, you may know you are anointed, but are you prepared? How well do you know what's on your life? This is something that is on God's heart. Because what I'm trying to do prophetically is give you some stewardship. There is a different anointing coming upon you. Many of you, when you leave here, there's going to be something very unusual that comes upon you. And you're going to have to learn how to walk in it. Because it's not going to be the strength that you had in the last season. Huh? There are different gifts that are going to open up in you that you're not used to working. There are different words that are going to come out of you. Many of you are going to preach and teach and there's going to be a, a, a confounding wisdom that comes from the ages out of your mouth. And you're going to be like, like, I didn't even realize that I know that. But the Spirit of God is going to quicken your mind and quicken your intelligence and enable you to engage the ancient writ of the Scriptures in a way you've never done before. And you must wear that well if you're going to handle war. I sense there are two anointings that are going to be birthed in a fresh way this weekend. And it's going to be the kingly anointing. Now, the way that kings function is to people, to territories, to areas. But a part of what they do is they serve as the, the, the judges of their people. They serve as the judges of their people. The Old Testament judges, before the monarchy came, functioned as the nation's rulers. But after Samuel came and brought the prophetic renaissance and christened the first king, the king then absorbed the role of a judge. So if there's a kingly anointing coming upon you, you must be versed in the wars of God. Through the book of Judges, you should learn what judges did. And you find that judges became premier when God's people were in a cycle. And the people of God did evil in the sight of the Lord and he raised the judge. Every chapter in the book of Judges opens up that way. So if God is going to pour something kingly or princely upon you, you have to know it's not for you to show off. It's not for you to get a website. It's not for you to become famous. It's for you to become acquainted with the griefs of a people and to become determined to be a liberating force. Now, when that happens, God has to prosper you. Because good kings don't lead bound people. And so God prospers kings to advance the prosperity of the people they lead. So there's a kingly anointing coming upon very many of you. I, when, we, when we walked in and we were in worship and prayer, I started seeing jewels and diamonds and gold falling from the sky. And I wasn't seeing it like we could collect it and use it as artifacts. I believe what God is doing uh, is raising vines of wealth, whole streams and networks of resource under the earth, in the waters, from the caves. It's not just going to be dollars and, 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 and economy that you can spend. I'm talking about God shifting your ability to do a thing and God even in this weekend is going to make many of you a personal bank he's going to make you a bank he's going to give you the power to release things into people and you will lend I feel that anointing right here you will lend to many nations and you will not borrow in the name of Jesus I bind the curse of rent I bind the assignment of leasing. I bind the curse of rent off of you. And I release upon you the hunger of a king, the power of a king, the irritation of a king, the vision of a king, the power of a king. He has made us kings and priests. And nobody follows broke kings. How many of you want to deliver the poor? Wave at me. How many of you are serious about delivering the poor? Where the first thing you need to do is not be one. It's warfare. It's warfare. Second anointing I see being released 
is a prophetic anointing. We're going to see kings and prophets move together. It's going to be a very powerful thing. Right now there is a crime in the earth where kings don't have their prophets and prophets are not ruling by their kings. One of the major mistakes in America is there are prophets moving and have not found their apostles. They're still moving like they're in the Old Testament, wandering, roaming, and, and homeless in caves, apart from the body. And then they have the nerve to be judging and, and, and criticizing a people they won't even be a part of. But this is going to be the Ephesians 2.20 hour, where we're going to see the foundations of apostles and prophets moving in tandem. The kingly anointing and the prophetic anointing are going to begin to happen. When that happens... The height of what we build is going to be much more superb than anything we've ever seen before. I believe that there is a prophetic anointing this weekend coming upon you intercessors. It's coming upon you psalmists. It's coming upon you counselors. Those of you that counsel people, there is an anointing for the discerning of spirits, for social workers, and those of you that minister, that you are physicians of the soul. So a power powerful prophetic anointing is coming upon you. For those of you that are prophets of God, there is a forensics level word of knowledge coming to you where you're going to help your government figure out crimes. You're about to figure out where missing people are. You're going to begin to identify who's guilty of certain judgments and you're going to be a solution. Come on, say let it be so. Say let it be so. Now these anointings are happening. I want to give this to you because I'm here to help you steward the anointing. God is about to empower this people in a way you can never imagine. And you will do it by the anointing. You will do it by the anointing. There is an anointing coming upon you women. He's doing something for the handmaidens of the Lord. He's doing something for women who will weep. He's empowering Esther's in this hour. And he's doing something where he's opening up and he's suspending second heaven activity to allow the daughters to go free. He's coming against the abuse and the stigma and the limitations and the restrictions upon women. And he's raising world changing women even from this people and this place. There is a focus coming upon you to achieve things you've never achieved before. Come on, say it is so. Say it is so. Say it is so. Many of you intercessors, here is, a, here is a supernatural crime. It should never be that an intercessor is poor. We are accustomed to watching intercessors pray and go without. But I believe that you never go to war without the spoils. If you spend all day binding strong men, laboring for other people, producing and birthing things in the spirit, you don't leave the wealth upon the carcass of what you defeated. If you are an intercessor in this place and you've been called to pray and called to cry out, I command the angels that retrieve wealth to be found in your direction. No longer will you go in your life borrowing and, and being without and, and not having enough, but I release the power of El Shaddai upon you. You are coming into more than enough and the abundance of God and the overflow of God in the name of Jesus come on intercessor take upon your royal garb take upon your power of access in the name of Jesus let it be so in this place that intercessors govern in the heavenlies and they receive spoils they receive spoils they receive spoils so these are anointings here is your homework you need a visitation from God about the anointing that's coming upon you. You've been frustrated because you're leaving out of one season and one level. And you're about to go into another one. And the anointing is coming upon you to achieve an effect. But you must become acquainted with what, what rests on your life. If you are ignorant of what rests upon you, it will work against you. You can be punished by what's on you if you don't know how to use it. God told Moses, don't throw this staff down. If you throw it down, I'll show you what will become of, come of it. He had the staff up, cast it down, and the same thing that split waters became a serpent. You have to know how to use your stuff well. Now, there is an identity crisis in the earth. There are many people that are afraid to be who they are because they don't have templates. 
So what they do is they go on YouTube or they go on the internet and they find a famous person to imitate and replicate. Because it's easier to be you if I'm still trying to learn to be me. And I've never seen a me before. So being me is scary and being you is safe. But your individuality is the key to mastering the anointing. You see, if I'm being you, then that means that nobody's being me. There are people who come up to me all the time and say, can I have your anointing? And I just smile and say, absolutely not. <laughs> I'm still using it. What you've got to do is find a way to access what God wants upon your life. Come on, lift your hands. Say, it's on me. Open your mouth. Say, it's upon me. Say, it's upon me. Say, it's upon me. You must know who you are because the anointing is coming upon you. It's not coming upon who you think you are. It's not coming upon who you really wish you are. It's coming upon who you are. So you must know yourself and know what God made you to be. You must unbecome. I release that upon your life. You must strip and you must unbecome everything you became in response to life. You must undo every vow, every covenant, every heart altar that you erected because of who hurt you, who abandoned you, who disappointed you. And you must take off that armor to allow the anointing to hit your own head. It's not coming upon grief. It's not coming upon regret. It's not coming upon sadness. It's coming upon your head. And if you don't strip and allow yourself to become loosed, you will never explore what rest on your, your life in the right way. Listen, remember when Lazarus was called out of the realm of the dead. You remember that? Jesus walks up, calls him forth. He comes up. He is alive, but he's not loosed. He's breathing, walking, functioning, and not loosed. God, Jesus, gives an assignment to those that are around him, saying these words, loose him, let him go. He charged his network, his friends, those that were around him to help him unrobe from the clothing that was upon him that helped him be dead. As a dead man, you had to be wrapped in certain stuff. But when life came back him, he had to take off what identified him as a dead man so that he can go free. Many of you, you're not dead anymore. You're saved. You're filled with the Holy Ghost. You're talking tongues. You're just not loosed enough. You don't have people around you that help you take off what you put on as a byproduct of death. But in the name of Jesus, I speak the miracle of the loosing of grave clothes upon you. And I command your mind to be loosed. I command your heart to be loosed. Hey, I command your heart to be loosed. I command your tongue to be loosed. I command your gifts to be loosed. I command your potential to be loosed. May your song be loosed. May your intelligence be loosed. May your hands be loosed. May your fire be loosed. May your feet be loosed. Your sons be loosed. Your daughters be loose. Your clarity be loose. Your boldness be loose. Your courage be loose. Your confidence be loose. Your money be loose. Your vision be loose. Be loose. Be loose. Be loose. Lift your hands and pray in the Holy Ghost, will you?